Last Friday, I did an interview with the Catholic TV station Salt and Light on their new online program called Hope from Home to talk about this this podcast, which I obviously really appreciated. And to help me out with the interview, they actually gave me the questions in advance, which I also appreciated. Uh, but then the host told me that depending on how the interview went, he might not get to all the questions, which is how things kind of played out. So given all that, what I'd like to do today basically is address one question that wasn't actually covered during the course of the interview, if only because it deals with the very important subject of where the people of God seem to be finding hope in the midst of these challenging circumstances. So basically, the original intention was that the last question would be sort of a two-parter. So the first part was supposed to be about where do you find hope within yourself, but then the second part was supposed to be about where do you find hope amongst the people of God. So just to let you know, in response to the first part of the question, what I basically said was that personally I find hope in the person of Christ as opposed to any particular set of circumstances. And the whole idea I was trying to convey there was that my personal sense of hope was not based on a particular set of circumstances or anything I could sort of uh, see and understand myself, but rather was based on the person of Christ, the one who himself is the way, the truth, and the life, and the one in whom the fullness of salvation is always meant to be found. But it just so happens that we never actually got to the second part of that question. Again, this idea of where do you find hope amongst the people of God? So perhaps I'm going to use this particular forum to suggest to you this. Personally, where I find hope amongst the people of God is in the fact that I think gradually people are starting to become ever more attentive to the present moment, which of course is a very important prerequisite to receiving the particular grace attached to the present moment. And so, for example, when you look at the writings of St. Paul, if you look at his early writings, you definitely get this distinct sense that he thinks that Christ is going to come back sooner rather than later. But then, in comparison, when you look at his later writings, you get the sense that he realizes we're kind of in this for the long haul. So we should perhaps, you know, build and plant and, and plan for the future, if you will. And the thing I want to impress upon you is that when St. Paul makes that spiritual move, he's not giving in to a sense of despondency or despair but rather he's coming to recognize intuitively that the way that the things of God tend to play out over the course of time, or the way that the grace of God tends to play out over the course of human history, is slowly and gradually over the course of the simple and the humble and the ordinary, as opposed to something which happens kind of all at once in a flashy sort of way. And again, that's not a move of despondency or despair, but rather that's a real step forward in terms of a personal awareness of how God's providential designs actually work in real time. But you see, more to the point, I'm starting to get the sense that the people of God are starting to become aware of this spiritual intuition that we're talking about with regards to St. Paul, except with regards to this current situation with the pandemic and the lockdown. In other words, I'm starting to get the feeling that rather than lament the loss of a past gone by or despair about an uncertain future, a lot of people are starting to recognize that there are many unique opportunities which are specific to this moment right now. And so, for example, I think a lot of people are starting to appreciate, like really appreciate, the fact that they just have time. Time to sleep, time to pray, time to read, time to spend quality time with family members within their immediate household, time to be alone with the Lord, to face the Lord, to face themselves, and thereby develop a certain deepening of one's spirit and one's humanity over a long period of time. But again, the point is that you wouldn't necessarily recognize these unique opportunities specific to the moment unless you have beforehand implicitly decided to be attentive to the present moment itself. You know, Bishop Robert Barron has a really interesting comment in this regard when he says that rather than run away from life because it's sometimes difficult or challenging or confusing, we would do well to remember the mystery of the Incarnation, this foundational mystery of our faith which tells us that the Son of God became man and dwelt among us, being born in the nothing town of Bethlehem before growing up in the equally nothing town of Nazareth, before embarking, of course, on the public life. And his whole point is that because of the great mystery of the Incarnation, we don't need to run away or be afraid of the present moment, even though it might be, again, difficult or challenging or confusing, but rather we can trust and believe that God's grace and His very presence are fully operative in the context of both the beauty and tragedy of life. You know, the example that comes to mind, there was this really great movie which came out in 2015, made by Pixar Films called Inside Out. And so the movie basically revolves around this little girl named Riley, 
who has in the back of her mind these five different emotions embodied by these five different characters, including joy, sadness, fear, disgust, and anger. And it just so happens that whenever Riley has an emotionally charged experience, a memory ball is generated in the back of her mind, which is colored according to the predominant emotion, which is associated with that particular experience. And so, for example, if she has a joyful memory, the memory ball is yellow, whereas if she has a sad memory, the memory ball is blue. In any case, early on in the film, Riley's family is forced to move from their beloved Minnesota to their new home in San Francisco because of a change in her father's work status, as a result of which, Riley starts to undergo all sorts of emotional turmoil. And so, for example, fear, anger, disgust, and even sadness, they take turns trying to emerge at the forefront of Riley's emotional center. But then what happens is kind of interesting, actually. Joy, who has sort of labeled herself as the leader of the group, makes it her personal mission to make sure that Riley is always joyful. And so from Joy's perspective, okay, there might be times when Riley is feeling anger, fear, or disgust. But the whole idea is that that can't last. She always has to quickly go back to feeling joyful. And whatever happens, whatever happens, she must never feel sad. Not simply because that's the right thing to do, but because Riley's trying to be a good girl. And apparently from Joy's perspective, and therefore Riley's perspective, uh, good girls don't get sad because they don't want to disappoint their parents who are kind of dealing with their own problems. In any case, by the end of the movie, primarily because Riley has been burying her sadness throughout the course of the film, she decides to make the really dramatic decision to get on a bus and run away from home and go back to Minnesota. At which point, Joy is kind of at her wit's end. And so basically what she does, she, she allows sadness to finally take control of Riley's emotional life. And so she finally allows Riley to feel sad. And so Riley comes to her senses, she gets off the bus, and she returns to her home in San Francisco, where she meets her parents. And at first, as to be expected, Riley's parents are very vocal about the fact that, you know, they were worried about her and whatnot. But then Riley suddenly begins to cry. And then she begins to speak. And what she says is this, I know you don't want me to, but I miss home. I miss Minnesota. You want me to be happy, but... I want my old friends, my old hockey team. I just want to go home. Please don't be mad. And with that, the parents kind of stop. They look at each other, then they look back at Riley. And then the mother says, oh, sweetie. And the father says, we're not mad. And then the father says, you know what? I miss Minnesota too. And then there's this beautiful moment where the parents start to recall a lot of things that they miss about being in Minnesota, and they all tie back to Riley. And so, for example, they start to say things like, I miss the woods where we used to hike. I miss the backyard where you used to play. And I miss the lake where you learned how to skate. And at that point, they all come together in this really tender embrace. But then what's interesting is that the camera then zooms in on Riley's face. And in the midst of this family hug, you see this, this really faint smile come upon her face, even in the midst of her tears. And at this point, a new memory ball is generated. But instead of being a solid color, again, like yellow for joy or blue for sadness, this time it's a mixture of two colors. So this time it's both blue and yellow. Because certainly it's it's a sad memory, right? It's a memory of loss. But at the same time, it is a joyful memory. A joyful memory where loved ones come together to support each other and to love one another in a moment of difficulty and pain and loss. And so what happens is that by the end of the movie, Riley comes to this very important point of spiritual and emotional maturity, where she realizes, I don't need to be afraid of my emotions. And more to the point, I don't need to be afraid of life. Because grace and blessings are abounding, both in the beauty and the tragedy of life. And perhaps I might suggest that's a really good lesson for each one of us, especially during this time of lockdown. And so instead of sort of holding your breath, if you will, until things become more certain or less confusing or less painful, perhaps you might choose instead to be fully attentive to the present moment, to recognize the unique opportunities which are associated with the present moment, and perhaps most importantly, realize that in a certain sense, there is nothing to be deferred. In other words, you got to really believe that in keeping with the great mystery of the Incarnation, Truly, God is fully present to you right now. 
loving you into existence, constantly shaping you into the person He is calling you to be, and showering upon you truly grace upon grace and blessing upon blessing in the midst of both the beauty and the tragedy of this life. And may God bless you all.